Now, Lord, we believe that thou dost not leave thy work unfinished. And if there is something yet to be added by thee, we ask thee that it may be in just as much light as at any time during these days. We pray that whatever the length of the message may be, it may all be to our real spiritual good and help. This may not be in a spiritual sense a tailing off and a fading out, a dropping away. Though many have gone, we do ask thee to keep the level high and the river of God full of water and we the trees of God full of sap. So help us in our need this evening for thy name's sake. Amen. Well then, we come to the last of this present course of meditations on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ as in some of the letters of the Apostle Paul. And this evening, of course, in the sequence, we reach the letter to the Philippians and the particular place, meaning, application of the cross as we have it in this letter. And to give it a name or a title or a heading, in this letter we have what I believe is quite true, the cross and the dynamic of victory. Once more, the phrase, the cross, may not be found here, but reference to it is quite definite. Perhaps the key to the letter might be the words to these Philippians, to you it has been given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. That is an undoubted reference to the place of the cross. Or later the very familiar words, Paul's cry that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. These and one or two other places imply very clearly in a very short letter comparatively that the cross has a very real, a very real place in this letter. You want the references without our turning and reading them, they are chapter 1 verse 29, chapter 2 verses 5 to 8, chapter 3 verses 3 to 10, and verse 18. These all bring us to the cross. Now no one who knows this little letter, this little big letter or this big little letter, will have any doubt that this is a letter of trial. It is undoubtedly and unmistakably a triumphant letter right from beginning to end. Now 
the apostle <coughs> refers to the beginning of things in his relationship with these Philippians and he refers to the suffering at the beginning and you remember the story of his coming at length into Europe Philippi and what he met almost immediately on arrival that demon possessed woman temple woman and I have often stopped with that and I stopped with it just for a moment on the way and asked you a question why should the devil preach the gospel this demon possessed temple woman cried out before all the people these men are the servants of the most high God who show unto us the way of salvation you couldn't have the gospel preached better than that could you why should demons do that oh the depths of Satan and why should the apostle quench it outright by casting the devil out of her well I leave the question for you to answer as you know sometimes Satan sponsors the things of God in order to discredit them and there's a lot in that well that's by the way the result of that incident as you know was Paul and Silas flashed and thrown into the inner prison with their feet made fast in the spot bleeding bruised but not disconcerted triumphant singing at midnight and singing to considerable consequence I like to think that Paul had a voice that he could sing amongst all the other things that he had he could sing I covet that there was a time when I could sing As a boy I was taken from place to place to sing before my voice gave out and uh, this is just a little personal reminiscence by the way and it has a lesson in it I think and then my voice broke and I wanted very much that when my voice came back my man's voice it would be a bass voice a good bass voice and when it came back it was a tenor <laughs> I made on the mask till in last and I foolishly the tenors will forgive me in those days I thought tenor voice well that's feminine that's <laughs> more like a woman's voice a bass voice and here I had a tenor what did I do tried to make it into a bass <laughs> and spoiled the whole thing and couldn't sing bass or tenor <laughs> Well, you can draw a lesson from that if you like. You very often interfere with the sovereignty of God and spoil everything. Well, Paul could sing and sing to some effect and sing at midnight. Now our point is that this is triumph. Triumph right at the beginning of the history of the church in Philippi and out from that first adversity and suffering and affliction and victory came that church and that church was very quickly precipitated into the same kind of antagonism and suffering and that persisted through the years until in this last imprisonment the apostle said to them 
in the present tense, it is given to you now in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but to suffer for his sake and there's more than that in the letter about his suffering because he speaks of now his present imprisonment saying that in Rome in prison in the last imprisonment probably the word has gone through all the Roman guards, the Roman praetorium, through all the Roman guards, and sinks in Caesar's household guard. Evidently, the slaves in the household of Caesar, the servants, were getting converted while this man was suffering in his final imprisonment. Well, for him and for them, it's a letter of triumph, isn't it? Wonderful triumph. And we want to find out what is the secret of this victory, the dynamic of victory. It is finally declared as to the Lord Jesus, you know, used into what is in our mechanical arrangement, chapter 2. Lord Jesus has gone down to the death, obedient unto death, yea, the death of the cross, for for God has highly exalted him. Given him the name which is above every name, victory, Victory, Paul. Victory, Philippians. Victory, Christ. That is what is here. But what we are concerned with in this brief space of time is the way of victory, and it's a very unnatural way of victory. A very unnatural way of victory. I don't know what you would even remote mentally figure conjure up as a picture of victory and the way to victory of course victory itself implies warfare and conflict yes but in this letter it's something more than that it's something more than that. This victory is not just objective, whether it be the Philippian jail or the Roman prison or the persecution from without. The victory is here subjective, inward. And it's a strange way of victory, you know, quite unnatural. And it is, in the main, supremely and preeminently presented in the case of the Lord Jesus, chapter 2, as you know, from verse 5 onward, the cycle, equal with God, equal with God, by his own right, in his own right, equal with God, in glory, he said through John, Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. All that, all the content of that, emptied himself. Found in fashion as a man, the form of a bond slave, obedient unto death, Yea, the death of the cross. From the highest height to the lowest depth. From the greatest fullness to the most utter emptiness. The cycle of victory. The cycle of victory, the way of victory. The great wherefore comes in at that deep point. The death of the cross.
wrong. An unnatural way, isn't it? Now you notice that this is taken by the apostles to be the history of Philippian believers and of course in our own case. In principle, the apostle takes that up from Christ and passes that over to believers and says, let this same mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. By the same process, by the same experience in principle, with certain differences between Christ and ourselves, always having to safeguard that, but in principle, the same cycle, the same history, the same experience for believers, let the same mind, the same mindedness, same mindedness that is at the same disposition the same disposition in Scotland uh, we have a way of speaking we uh, we are asking somebody if they are going to do something or want to do something we say are you minded to do so are you minded a mindedness, a disposition, an attitude. Let this same disposition be in you as was in Christ Jesus. And the result will be the same. In both ways, down, down, down you go until you touch what and at the bottom the terminus is met and things turn round and up and up but there's no up until there's been the down no up until there's been the down and this is not something in our history which is done once and for all it was in the case of the Lord Jesus and that is one of the difference very often when I want to get a touch with a man if I'm going into a store and I go up in the elevator I say to him well your life is made up of ups and downs isn't it and of course he catches on and I say be sure that you finish up and not down that is the Lord's mind it may be through the way down but through the way down it's the way up now I want to make this very brief and get to the real point of this taking this mind disposition of Christ which was put into action, into effect, so fully and utterly, what did it amount to? Exactly what happened? Well, the Lord Jesus and this mind that was in Christ Jesus was that of a wonderful capacity that you and I have got to have inculcated in us as the only way to victory the capacity for letting go the ability to let go we know and you've heard it probably many times before that this fragment in chapter 2 this letter about his being equal with God his great emptying, self-emptying and coming down to the utmost depth is an oft 
upset to some people an offset to some people it is the offset to all the work that ever Satan did and the motive or the mindedness the disposition of Satan out of which all this age long mischief and ruin has come was acquisitiveness possessiveness drawing to self having uh, and holding for oneself for the scriptures show us that Satan was cherubim that covered evidently in a very high place possibly if not exactly next to the sun very near to the sun but envious of the sun this is why you see covetousness is idolatry it's satanic covetous envious possessive acquisitive to have what God has not intended him to have that which was reserved for the son well he made his bid for equality equality with God in the place of the son and the history awful history no dear friends our spiritual history looked at from one standpoint in the scripture our spiritual history is the undoing of the work of the devil you know that? unbelief was the downfall of Adam therefore faith is the undoing of the work of the devil there that's why it's so important and all things like that now well, here to undo that possessiveness that acquisitiveness, that unlawful ambition, to undo it in principle. There had to be somebody who voluntarily emptied himself of his own rights and of all that those rights were and contained. To undo this awful thing not in himself for that was never true of Jesus but to undo it in mankind and by his cross he destroyed the works of the devil the son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil and the first and most awful work of the devil was this aspiration to have to acquire you know uh, Cain is said by the scriptures in the scriptures to be of that evil one he, because says the writer he was of that evil one the name Cain means acquisitive acquisitive of the evil one this is where all our ambition to be something, to have, to possess, to hold, to keep, power, power, supremacy, domination, where it all comes from, from the evil one. And the undoing of it all as a principle and with all its consequences is firstly in Christ the mind that was in Christ Jesus and then that transferred to the Philippians and I think the Philippians were a beautiful example of this you know although there was a necessity for saying it to them which necessity we need not dwell upon because it's here in the letter nevertheless they were beautiful examples of this letting go, giving, releasing, 
one of the things the apostle says about their generosity. Their, their thought for him. Their care for him. They were the first to think of this man's situation. He might be perhaps going without food. He might be short of clothing. He may be living in penury without the necessities or even the lux some luxury in his prison. They are thinking of him doing all they can to minister to him. How, how grateful he is in this letter for that. Read it again. The outgoing, the letting go without thinking of what it cost them. The mind that was in Christ Jesus. Now, whatever the method, however it was done, the principle. This is the thing we want to get and go away with. Dear friends, the cross here is the symbol of victory. Don't forget it. Make any doubt about it. Have any doubt about it. It's the symbol of victory. But, but, the principle of the cross in this letter is the power, the ability to let go. To let go to God. To relax your grip, your hold. Let it go. Right through biblical history you will see that victory, marvelous victory came when that was the issue. Even sometimes, sometimes when it was something God given and God asked for it back. It wasn't always something bad that you've got to give up or something questionable you let go. No, something God given. Isaac was ever anything more God given than Isaac? Miracle of God was Isaac. What a gift. Supernatural gift. Impossible perhaps. I think we can say certainly impossible of repetition. Take thou thy son thy own whom thou lovest offer him given by God miraculously supernaturally in answer to long prayer many many hard groans the despair of the situation the hopelessness then given in God's sake hand it up hand him up offer him well, what about it? Was that cross victory? In thy seed, in Isaac, shall thy seed be called. In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. This is the mighty, mighty victory of being able to let go. Of course, I could dwell upon this and apply it in many, many ways. Some of us, you know, to whom God, we feel, undoubtedly gave ministry, called us to the ministry, gave us a ministry, we have been brought to the place where we've had to hand back our ministry to the Lord. Hand it back. Say, Lord, all right. If you don't want us to go on, here it is. You gave. You can take. And for the time being, feel the desolation of that loss. I think I can say, I think I can say, it hasn't been lost. There's been something more afterwards. Something more. A lot of history in what I'm saying. God gave. And Job, I'm only quoting Job, aren't I? The Lord gave. 
and the Lord has taken away and triumph blessed be the name of the Lord I don't know that we've all got there but I have got there absolutely when some of these things happen and I spontaneously say blessed be the name of the Lord no there's agony and anguish at least for the time being but there is spiritual enlargement and spiritual gain God is no man's debtor well that principle here in Philippians and you notice how the apostle takes it up in his own case he doesn't say it in as many words that this mind that was in Christ Jesus is in me and I followed it out but in what he says he exemplifies it he tells us that of all the things that were gained to him all the advantages of wealth, inheritance, upbringing, education, success, climbing to the top of the tree in his profession as a rabbi, and all that that meant of influence and opportunity and power and possession what a fullness this man had naturally before his conversion and then he says in this letter the things which were gained to me these have I counted loss of Christ all gone all gone will you tell me that whole letting go has been lost to him to God to the church uh, what we what we should have lost to all these centuries if Paul had held on to all those advantages things that he said were gained were gained and they were if he held on No, he let go. But now do you notice what he said? After all that, and he says, I, I can't have lost. I, I was refuge, refuge, refuge. That's the value of them as I see it now. We'll see in a moment why. I see it now. Rock, uh, just refuge. But he said, Brethren, brethren, I count not myself to have attained, neither am I already at this time, the end of my life, full life, all the age, all the age, because that belonged to uh, 20 centuries ago. I was a young man according to standards today I'm long way ahead of Paul's years but for him a long full life the end of it all I count not myself to have attained neither am I already complete but this one thing I do forgetting the things which lie behind I press toward the mark of the on high calling of God in Christ now that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering you notice the course notice the course resurrection Fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. The climax of the risen life is the cross. You got that? The climax of the risen life is the cross. Because all our knowing of the power of his resurrection 
will only lead us further and further into the meaning of the cross. And to what? Be made conformable unto his death. To attain unto the art resurrection from among the dead. Something, something far greater than that initial experience of union with Christ in resurrection. But it's down, you see. The way of victory is ever and always the growing capacity to let go to the law. While we hold on, stand our ground, claim our rights, keep things in our hands, we're in defeat. There are a thousand ways in which this can be applied. But dear friends, in, in many, many ways, the Lord waits for this principle to be applied or to work out. A wife is jealous of her husband. And she prays and prays and prays and the Lord never answers. Never answers. She wants to hold him. Keep him to herself. Just have him in her possession. Prayers are not answered. Nothing happens. Till one day the Lord says, Let him go. Let go. If you will let go, I'll take hold. And it's when we learn, like that, it may be the other way round. I only take that. Not because all women are jealous the best way. But men can be just the same, you know jealous of their wives of their children and keep such a tight hold not going to let go or something, anything I've mentioned ministry no matter what it is if you and I hold this to ourselves even though it may be something not wrong not evil in itself not sin in itself We've got hold of this. And we've got hold of our own position and our own right. And we are not going to let go. Now you know that was the reason for the defeat of the Corinthian church. The awful defeat at Corinth spiritually was they would not let go their love for power their love for worldly wisdom their love for emotional gratification drawing all these things even spiritual things to themselves and it was not until they were broken on that and you have the brokenness of the second letter to the Corinthians where they are indeed broken that their victory came victory why have you got this you want victory it may be you see that there is some kind of controversy over letting go to the law taking your hands off Oh, it's a great lesson that we have to learn in the Christian life to keep our hands off of the ark, of people. Oh, it's fun with our own hands direct people's lives, cause them to take the course that we think they ought to take. Impose our minds of judgments and wills upon people. Remember so many years the law ago the Lord said, Take your hands off and I'll do it. Take your hands off. 
Oh, how we love, don't we, to put our hands on people's lives and on people. It's this love of power, inborn, inbred love of power to have. And the way of the cross is the way of letting go even good things to the Lord, if he requires. Now, you see, here at Philippi's virtue, something that evidently was there. I uh, beseech Rudia and Simpici to be of the same mind, one with another, two dear women, women. Remember Captain Wallace and quoting that misquoted it. I beseech odious and soon touches to be of the same mind. <laughs> odious and soon touchy, well it may be. But evidently there was something there between these two and they were standing for their own right. One was not giving way to the other. Not saying I'm at fault. Pride, pride, making them hold their ground, their own ground. Perhaps one was in the right but that one was not going to let go of her right. And that's why the apostle said, let this mind be in you, as in Christ Jesus. He had right. Unquestionably, his were right in his own right. Yours may not be your right, after all, but whether they be or not, the point is, you let go. You let go. You surrender. You put this in the Lord's hands and take your hands off. You'll be willing to suffer the loss of all this for his sake. And while that is the cross, it's victory. Wherefore God has highly exalted it. Well now I close that Mark is calling your attention then to this. How was it that the Apostle Paul was able to do this? Suffer the loss of all things. Count all the things which were gained as mere wretchedness. How could he do it? You see, it's just the captivation of Jesus Christ. And that's a great test, isn't it? For me to live this life. I have no other object or motive in living but Christ. Christ. Look at the large place that Christ has in this letter again. And for me to live is Christ. And I can do all things through him, Christ, who strengthens me. He was captivated by Christ. And that captivation by Christ, Christ that he had seen, come to know and so infinitely, infinitely greater than beyond all these things which he at one time counted gain. Position in the world, and possessions in the world, and everything. These are nothing when you see the Lord Jesus. And there's no other way of victory but seeing the Lord Jesus. But it's only crucified people who truly see the Lord Jesus. Know that? Well, that's enough. Is that closing the conference on depressing? No? I didn't mean that. I meant victory. Either way of victory. Yes, the cross is not just losing everything and having a miserable life stripped of all. The cross is victory. It's gain out of loss. It's life out of death. It's much out of living. That's the cross. We 
plate. Our Lord, do write into our hearts all that it has been thy desire for us to really know in these days and cover it there, protect it there, and give us grace to respond in obedience to every challenge, every call, and to make us people so self empty of pride and personal interest and all that so empty and so taken up with thyself, Lord Jesus, so enamored of thee, so captivated by thee, that nothing is too much to let go for thee. May this be the dynamic, the captivation of the Lord Jesus at every cost. And now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we are, all things, unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus unto all ages forever and ever. Amen.